Hi, everyone. My name is Kaseba Chibwith, and I currently attend Loyola U Chicago. I'm majoring in criminology and criminal justice with also double minoring in psychology and women and gender studies. And I'm here to host the Gen Z Takeover with the First Inclusion Project. I think it's so important to get as many voices as possible um, when it comes to anti-racism and what that looks like. And people always say that it's the young ones who are responsible for making the future a better place. So I think it's important that our voices are heard. Um, the first inclusion project is a safe, judgment-free place for allies and people to come and talk about their most important questions on anti-racism. And we're here to answer them. So huge thank you to everyone joining us today. Let's meet our Gen Z takeover panelists. Please tell us who you are, where you are from, where you're in school, your year in program, and why you've said yes to do this panel. Hi everyone, my name is Liana Pamuseno. I am currently a sophomore at Scripps Ranch High School. And um, the reason why I'm here today is because um, like our other fellow panelists, I am a um, Gen Z advocate. And I believe how Kaseva said, Gen Z is our future. So it's important that our voices are heard. I'm an advocate for juvenile justice reform and gun violence prevention. And um, anti-racism is something that we really need to tackle together as a generation. Hi, my name is Karen Aguirre and I go to Mar Vista High School. I'm currently a senior and I am a participant today because I have seen the amazing work that Inclusion First has done and I wanted to be a part of this conversation. I'm a big advocate for how climate change affects uh, people of color and minorities. And I wanted to bring that into the conversation of how anti-racism cannot be straight in your face. It can be lurking in institutions and the way housing is set up. And I think collaboratively by doing these kinds of discussions we can learn so much. So I'm excited to do that here today. Hi everyone, my name is Bella Quilici. I am a junior at Sonoma Valley High School. Um, and I joined this, uh, this conversation because of my friend Gabriel, who I met um, while working with California high school students for Biden. Um, Gabriel let me know about this opportunity. And, you know, as somebody who feels you know, really passionate about, you know, solving social justice issues. Um, this is, this was just another um, amazing opportunity um, to, you know, make my voice heard, you know, especially it's frustrating, you know, not being able to vote. Um, so I try and take any opportunity I can to raise my voice and uh, fight for change. Hi everyone, I am Char Coates. I am a sophomore at Loyola University, Chicago. Um, I'm a double major in political science and sociology with a concentration in social justice and change with a minor in theology on the pre-law track. Um, I am here mainly because my friend Kaseba told me about this opportunity, um, but also because um, just similar to the same sentiments that have been shared by the other panelists, um, anti-racism is something that I care a lot about. And um, I have just, for as long as I can remember, have been an advocate or a student leader in regards to um, standing up for systemic racism within education. And also I've been a longtime volunteer for um, an advocate for working for um, impoverished communities that are mainly dominated as minority populated communities that don't have the same access to whole foods and organic goods as well. So hello everyone, my name is Gabriel. I'm also from Arista High School with Karen. I'm a senior. Um, I'm sort of part of this conversation due to my previous conversation with Kasiwa and Kerry um, with a former police chief and we had a sort of like a really ongoing conversation about anti-racism and I want to be a part of that conversation once again but with Gen Z who's been seeing a lot happening now and it seems as we get older like things are sort of getting worse. So having a sort of conversation about how to tackle that and then having to tackle sort of 
different ideas with anti-racism is very important. I've dealt with a lot of, I don't know, in between schools and outside of schools, um, mostly focusing on social policy. Again, I met with Bella, meeting with like high schoolers for Biden. So I've, that's mostly what I've been working on. Great, thank you so much for those beautiful introductions. Um, quick reminder, we want to continue to hold this safe space for learning and asking questions about anti-racism. And there are just a couple of things that I would like everyone to keep in mind during our time together. So the first thing is that this is a safe space. All questions are welcome. Um, no shame or blame, it's a judgment-free zone. We are all speaking for ourselves and ourselves only. So when you hear the answers, take it for the inner, the individual, not the whole. We don't know everything. It's a continual like learning process and we're all in this together. It's a lifelong journey and everyone is at a different point and your role in driving change will be unique. It's not going to look the same for every person. We just want to make sure that we're making the world a better place. So today we have prepared some topics that we'd love to talk about. Um, we've got some incredible questions that are sent in and we'd love to take your questions as well. So please feel, feel free to ask any questions that you may have in the chat as the conversation um, goes on and we'll work some into. And we will also have the Q&A at the end. So there will be a chance to ask um, any further questions. And without further ado, let's get started. So what is anti-racism and what does it look like in action? You're on mute, Gabriel, I think. No, I'm like, I'm like thinking about what I want to say. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, you know, I think anti-racism, it's like I've said before, it's sort of like a big umbrella. Um, and it sort of covers a lot and it spans a lot. And it's, you know, not only being proactive about the environment that you're in, but um, being proactive about what you're learning and sort of what that environment is projecting. So I think, you know, actively being like an anti-racist is not only being aware of how things are sort of working behind the background against people of color, it's um, being proactive and making the change. You know, it's not only being aware of what's happening, it's you being aware of how you can make a change. Um, and that's basically what, what I, what I, as far as I know, you know, I've been learning a lot about what anti-racism is, you know, because for so long, it, it feels like it's not something that's fully addressed. You know, it's always like either you're a racist or you're not racist. There's like, it's, there's a little bit more to that sort of narrative. And I know being anti-racist is more than just being not racist. So, you know, I'd, I'd love to open it up for you guys and seeing what you guys think about that. Yeah, I totally agree with the the point that, you know, anti-racism isn't just like not being racist, you know, it's it's educating yourself and others, it's, you know, the way you vote, it's, you know, raising your voice because it's not enough to just not be racist. Like if you truly care, it will show in the way um, that you vote and you take action to solve these issues. Um, yeah, I completely agree. I think that um, there is most definitely a grand or a huge umbrella like what Gabriel was saying in regards to what anti-racism truly is. Um, but like in, in the sense that you can't, anti-racism is one, identifying that there is an issue or there is some form of like framework or policy or whatever the case may be that is going against a certain group or minority. Um, but it's also taking that a step further as what Gabriel and Bella were saying and doing something about that and putting action behind that. And that action can be different. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be that you're out there protesting on the streets, but it could be that you're having meetings with very important people in order to um, create new policies and frameworks and amendments to certain things in order to make sure that people feel um, more included or that we're gaining a little step closer to more of a equitable atmosphere or presence or yeah I think that's what I'm trying to say yeah and to add on to that I think um inclusion is very important uh just to think about how in a whole we can 
think about other people and how you know it's not just about policy it could also be the way we talk in our family um conversations that we can have with them or with our friends i think it's uh, a big of just it's not like government it's also societal you know how we can take those small changes of being like oh let's not use this vocabulary let's change this and then that makes it more inclusive and then that makes it more taking a step for, further into a more inclusive um environment yeah, I would definitely agree with what Karen said. And I think a big part of that is having those conversations and really listening and understanding, kind of similar to what um, Gabriel said earlier, there's like a big difference between saying I'm not racist as compared to anti-racism. You know, for example, um, anti-racism is not necessarily looking at the racial group, but all the policies that put those racial groups at a disadvantage. So I think just um, listening and understanding is a big part of taking action and is probably a first step in taking action of being anti-racist. And you know, that's, those are all very great points. And I think, you know, one of a common thing here is about having conversations. Right now we are having a conversation, but we are all collectively um, working towards ways to create change. But what about when the conversation gets tough? What about handling conversations about race and social injustices with family members or friends who aren't anti-racist? Those conversations with people who are not open to, you know, trying to be a better person and create change. How do you handle those conversations or what advice do you have for people struggling with those conversations? Um, I'm going to kick this one off and um, just start off by saying it's never easy <laughs> um, and most definitely um, just but it's never easy but it, it has to be done and it has to be said because if you just brush it under the rug and allow for it to be somebody else who provides the answer or wait for somebody else to provide the answer or wait for them to learn they're never going to learn. Um, and you're only going to be more of the problem, actually, because you decide to sweep it under the rug or think that it's okay because that's your grand aunt Josephine who makes the best peach cobbler in the world. Like, it doesn't matter. Um, and I think, if anything, that shows that, if anything, it should make somebody, it should make you feel good to know that you decided to have that conversation. And even if they decide to still think the way that they think, you can go about knowing that um, you did the right thing. You can go about knowing that you at least try to educate them. And even if they say that they still believe what they wanna believe, I guarantee you nine times out of 10 that they still took the words that you said and it's still with them. And it's still gonna, it's gonna be something that they think about, even if it's not something that they wanna admit that they're wrong on, because I'm the type of person I hate admitting if I'm wrong, I think I'm right about everything. So like, I do understand, like if somebody is there to correct me, especially if it's something that I've always had as a, as a mindset, but I guarantee that it's something that someone is going to think about. So the advice that I would give is to take that risk, because if it's truly something you believe that is important, you're going to say something and you're going to stand up for it. So yeah. You know, I think it's moments where I forgot who had talked to me about this because obviously this isn't the first time where we've had a sort of conversation in this narrative like that. Um, I remember when they were sort of talking to us and saying like, you know what, there's a lot of frustration when you're talking with a person and saying like, you can't really say this or you shouldn't really be thinking this sort of mentality. And it's just sort of like you're hitting something like a wall and it's just like splicing apart. And I remember that they had told me, it's like, you know what, like keep your patience because at the end of the day, like it'll show how remarkable you, like how passionate you are about what you're saying without you offending another person because you're just working at sort of counterintuitive kind of movement. If you're being loud and aggressive and you're sort of pushing onto another individual, you're not really sort of getting the message across of like you're trying to unify and sort of envision everyone together. You know, obviously, because that's, you know, being actively like anti-racist, you want to ensure that everyone feels included in an environment. And so you sort of having that, I don't know, mentality of just going forward and attacking, it's not really going to help anyone in the end. So I think, you know, a lot of a lot of it, having these conversations is just being kind and patient and sort of be listening, like listen to their point, but also make sure, you know, you have your point. <laughs> 
Right. And, you know, I think one of the things is that sometimes an often thing that we hear is, you know, it's this year, it's 2020, it's 2021. Why haven't people still, why haven't you understood racism? What is it that you, what's not clicking for you? And I think, you know, patience is the key because I think sometimes we forget how things are deeply rooted. Like if you've grown up a certain way for probably more than a decade, it's hard to undo, especially if diversity and inclusivity is not present in your life. If your friends aren't diverse, you're not going to be seeing their issues. So you won't be learning from them. And then if you have negative experiences with whatever kinds of people that you have these ignorant assumptions about, that has now become your truth because you've made this statement and here's the proof that you have because you've experienced it time and time again. So I think having, you have to have patience when having these conversations. It's not going to be as simple as, well, you can't be racist. You can't say that about a group of people because it's not okay. I think sometimes people have to see why it isn't okay and how it affects people because you may be able to talk about it but if you're not seeing it it may it may not click for you so I think patience is key I like that right I would definitely agree with Kaseba saying like patience is so important um I know sometimes it can definitely be hard in those conversations but I think um also um since listening is important it's also to show that you're listening like um, you have to show the person that you're actively listening, that you're um, necessary, like you're understanding their conversation, letting them finish, not cutting them off. And um, just like to draw the line on that is also to know when to agree and when to disagree. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that's definitely a really important part of the conversation as well. Yeah, I definitely 100% agree with, you know, what everybody is saying and kind of going back to what Char was saying earlier, you know, it's, it's really difficult to deal with stubborn people. Um, You know, I, you know, both sides of my family are kind of on like very opposite spectrums of the, you know, political, you know, spectrum. Um, And, you know, it's, it, it is difficult to have those conversations, but I like everybody saying, I think it's important to be patient. Um, it's important to not, you know, lose control of your emotions. And I know I'm very guilty of that because I'm a very, you know, passionate and um, emotional person, but you kind of just have to, you know, first of all, like, you know, as a white person, I think it's important to listen to people of color because obviously, you know, I don't have the same experiences, but I think it's important to first educate yourself and making sure that you are listening to other activists. And also when you're having that conversation, you know, simply speaking on, you know, facts and sharing other people's um, experiences and kind of putting it into um, perspective for that person. Um, And I also think it's important, you know, especially with, you know, friends, because, you know, I mean, all of us have been in high school or are in high school. So, you know, we all know what it's like to, you know, be sitting at lunch and, you know, somebody says something, Uh, you know, somebody says a racist joke and, you know, other people start laughing, but then it's like, well, that's, you know, not okay. But there's also like, you know, pressures to be like, oh, you can't, you know, shut that person down or else you're going to lose that friend. But I think, you know, in order to be anti-racist, you have to do the right thing and, you know, try and tell that person why, you know, what they said was wrong. And just to add on to that, I think one of the hardest things also when talking to someone and them not agreeing with you is consistency and the patience, because sometimes you just kind of want to say, oh, I give up. Like, you obviously aren't listening to me, but I think it's kind of just being slightly vulnerable and saying this is something that A, really impacts me or B, I see impact a lot of people. So I think just holding that to your truth of this is something that matters a lot. And I think Char had said it that they'll reflect on it, even if they don't agree with you in the moment, it's some that conversation will have some sort of impact. And maybe if all a lot of people are having these conversations with them, they'll slowly build up. And the more diverse they get, the more they're like, oh, maybe I was in my own little bubble and I didn't really understand, but I think I'm starting to now. 
So I think that's what's really important. Just these small little moments just collect up into something bigger. Right. And, you know, reflection leaves room for growth always. And, you know, a huge thing is what what does racism look like when it's not in your face? Because for me, when I was younger, I thought, oh my gosh, I'll know someone's racist if they call me the N-word. Like that will be the determining, you know, factor. But then slowly but surely, the older I got, I saw that racism was a little bit more complex and hidden than I thought. And I think there's a variety of ways that racism like creeps in and people don't necessarily pay attention to it or they're not even aware of it at all and how it affects other people. Yeah, just to start that conversation up, I think, um, you know, there really is like a word for that, like when it's not in your face, that's systematic racism. And that includes everything from like politics to healthcare to food um, to education, income. And I'll leave that there for everyone else because I know they can definitely add in on that. But um, I think systematic racism is definitely just huge. Okay, I'll go. Um, it, first of all, I want to clear because I know that a lot, a lot of you guys are seeing me and you guys will see me do this and you'll see me do this. I always keep a notepad of whatever you guys are saying because sometimes you guys are, like say some really wonderful words and I want to like go back on them. So if you see me like glancing towards the side, like I'm just taking little notes. Um, and I think that sort of systemic racism is just, and it's narrative, it, it, it's deeply rooted with, again, with going with a lot of things. But, you know, I think one of the main points that I think was really really going forward is sort of education. It's where, you know, we need to advocate for equitable funding, where, you know, lower income communities have lower, like, you know, they're, they're paid lower for their salaries. It's where like most students about like a good handful of students have uh, police officers in their schools, but they don't have nurses or they don't have counseling centers, you know, and it's usually schools that are the majority of students of color. Um, you know, that's sort of systemic racism where students aren't giving access to these resources, not only because the funding isn't there, but there's just not a lot of like attention to it. Um, I'm actually going to sidestep from what anti-racism looks like from like a systemic side and go into more of like a social side, um, because I think that sometimes what anti-racism looks like are the microaggressions and the cold stares and the um, slightly awkward, uncomfortable shifts people make when um, a black person or any minority person steps into a room or sits next to them or something. Um, and I think that in order to combat that or to in some way, I guess, resolve that, but that's like more so people's own behaviors. Um, it's a, how we were saying, in the last question is just to be brave to have those conversations. Like I can say personally, I had a former roommate who was very, very consistent with having a lot of microaggressions to say about me and being black and how she didn't feel like black history was really American history. Um, and for me, it was, it was very hard to hear that because I was, that was like the first time that I ever actually heard words like that come out of someone's mouth and I could have most very easily told her off and where to go and how to get there. Um, but I also, but I took it as a opportunity to educate her or try my best to educate her. Um, and I think, I think it was Karen who said in the last question that sometimes people just have to see it. And it honestly wasn't until sadly it took that long, but it wasn't until the death of George Floyd that she understood that racism is still alive and well and prevalent. Um, within our society, within our, the institution that we call America. And um, she like texted me immediately and had so much to say. And it was just a, very apologetic and it was sincere. And it was also her asking, how do you do, how do I do more? And how can I get more educated? And her recounting back on the times of when I did take the time to educate her. Um, and I think it's moments like that of if in regards to just addressing anti-racism and a social aspect of just having those conversations that that stuff will stick to people. And sometimes people will 
lean on, not necessarily lean on you to educate them because that's not your job, but lead on you to point them in the right direction on how to educate themselves. I think it's a lot with the narrative of our personal experiences because we can throw in a lot of facts and I love that, that, that usually what I've seen is with a lot of individuals, it sort of goes more with what's been happening. So a lot of with the George Floyd, it was sort of like a, an experience that people got to see. Although we can spit so many facts about like incarceration and funding there and a lot of that, it's seeing experiences like that that have really shaped the narrative of people between being like not racist and anti-racist. So I think one of the big things that, you know, when we're having these kind of conversations um, is to speak from experience or at least, you know, lead the narrative towards experiences, although some of us may not, you know, be personally affected by issues like that. Um, I think, you know, proving examples of those kinds of experiences still existing today is enough to even convince some people that, you know, what racism is still prevalent and it's still alive. You know, you bring up an incredible point. I think even um, just going back to what Char had said about her roommate and how she ended up coming back around. I think another thing that's on people's minds is just how, you know, is it the responsibility of people of color um, to do the educating, right? To take on that burden. And I think I've come to a place where I will educate those who are willing to be educated just because sometimes, you know, you can only, you can only do so much. And I think Char handled it very well. You know, she did what she could, you know, she picked her battles. And when she was ready to, you know, learn and actually when she understood herself, what it meant to be like on the anti-racist journey, she came and asked for help, but Char didn't close the door. She had the door still open. And I think it's just super important to understand that no, you cannot expect people of color to continuously hold your hand through this and that it's um, okay to pick up some books or some great resources, um, YouTube videos, documentaries, films, um, and just at least try to do the work first yourself because every time sometimes it gets overwhelming because you have to relive certain experiences and you know something like George Floyd it's very difficult sometimes to explain why that death um affected affects me as a black person because people will say oh but it wasn't you you know it's not your family but it is in a way it is you know it can happen to anyone that I know and it shouldn't happen to anyone that I know. So I think people should definitely just be respectful and also um, be mindful to that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point on how the weight kind of should be shared. I think we talked about this previously um in the prep meeting uh, and how or I, I think it was one of the seminars I don't know but I, I heard I heard it here I think that the weight should be shared it shouldn't be just one person carrying the weight of anti-racism it's like oh I'll lend you a hand and we'll combat this together and um it's it's actually pretty easy to learn about uh the works of of racism in our government or anything that you want to learn about. Um, last year, I spent a lot of time learning about how housing uh, really affects uh, impoverished communities and people of color because they place them in very polluted areas and how that leads to health issues because of low air quality. And it was just a click away. It was just a documentary. It was just an article. So I think those are things that are very accessible that we can do. And I think Gen Z recognizes that because we have technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think education is like super, super, super um, important. Like in fact, um, in school right now, I'm writing a research paper on um, why controversial monuments uh, should be taken down and removed and kind of just 
you know, over the, uh, this, over the summer, I saw, you know, a lot of the um, unfortunate Confederate statues being removed and a lot of, you know, the Christopher Columbus statues being removed. And I think that that is great, but, you know, um, that's, you know, an actionable thing that people can do to try and help because obviously, obviously we've seen um, with the, you know, storming of the Capitol, it is dangerous to not say anything or to not, you know, do anything because I think with, you know, the former administration that was in charge, you know, over the past four years, I've kind of, you know, seen, you know, racism being encouraged and also kind of people just slowly crawling out of their like hole and kind of, you know, being more, you know, up in everybody's faces about, you know, um, about their unfortunate, you know, racial biases and stuff. Um, and that's why I think education is so important because obviously we've seen that if you don't say anything or if you don't educate yourself or don't try to educate others, it, it results in uh, violence, which is really unfortunate. You know, absolutely. Um, it's just a really quick thing. I definitely want to address this question really quickly. Um, it's how do you approach your older family members who may have a more conservative or racist mindset? I don't think this person might have been there earlier. So if anyone wants to touch base on that quickly with the advice. All right, uh, I'll go. Um, I think one of the main key sort of, sort of well, pieced our conversation together when we were talking about how we should have these kinds of conversations is patience. So I think a lot of that, and I really love Karen's point of like bringing it up and having sort of snippets because eventually it's, it's something that, you know, will, having someone with that sort of conservative mindset, this kind of conversation isn't going to happen once. So I think when these conversations are happening, just understand that like, we need to be patient and be understanding. Although we may not necessarily agree or you know, think the same mindset as another individual who might have a very opposing view. I think them knowing that you're listening into how they're feeling um, is enough for them to understand that, you know what, these experiences are happening. There's a lot happening in the world and just how you're like sort of listening to me, like I would hope that you would listen to me too. Thank you, thank you, Gabriel. Um... What do you feel is the most effective thing or things allies can do to help bring about real change? Um, I think the first step is educating yourself. Um, I think it's it's important to, um, you know, overcome, you know, any sort of racial biases that you might have. And it's, it's, it's important to, you know, the second step would be just listening to other people of color and listening to you know other people's experiences so i think it's important to first you know educate yourself and listen um to other people but um it's and then you know take that take what you've learned um and there are so many ways to to make change you know you can go out and protest you know you can join conversations like this um and it's it's also in the way that you vote because voting is such a, a a powerful right um that everybody should have and i think that um that that is a huge way to make change but obviously if you are not 18 like me you know that can be frustrating when you can't vote um but that's why i joined uh several organizations over the summer um you know i spent like most of my summer like with gabriel actually you know trying to um, elect uh, President Bi Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. And while I don't, you know, completely agree with everything that they've done, I think, you know, it was definitely, it's a step in the right direction. Um, and so I think just, you know, going out and organizing and educating yourself is uh, definitely a way to do that. Yeah, I um, definitely would agree with Bella. And I think that a next step after educating yourself is also reflecting on yourself. You know, it's kind of, you have to be real with yourself, confront the racist ideas maybe you've held in the past or reflect on, um, you know, how you can be, and like now how you can be better. 
because oftentimes it's it's easy to have conversations or not necessarily easy but it'd be easier to have conversations with other people and tell them how they should act but it's also important to remember um and reflect on yourself on how you should act as a person and lead by example kind of like a parent um you know you have to yeah you have to lead by example and i think that's a really big part of this conversation as well um i personally think i most definitely agree that there has to be reflection and there most definitely has to be education as an ally to a movement. But I also think that if you are an ally to a movement, also know when it is your place to step down um, and to make sure that space is being given to the to the people it's meant to be given for. Um, most definitely go to protests, but understand where you stand as an ally in regard to those protests. Your voice should not be heard louder than the than those who you are marching for. Um, and you should not be at the forefront of those movements. You should be on the not necessarily on the sidelines, but you should be like the cheerleaders of those movements. You know what I mean? Like when a basketball game is going on, we don't need you to shoot the hoop. Like we don't need you to shoot, but we just need you to, you know, be there encouraging um, and helping provide some form of strategy. And also knowing that when it comes to being a part of a movement that you don't necessarily need, obviously like not be in the forefront, but there's so much that goes on to a movement that makes it what it is, there's the marketing of it, there's the logistics of it, um, there's the, the strategy, there's per being the person to provide the aid and the help afterwards and or like in a debrief or something. Um, and also like being a part of these conversations and just most definitely being a listener and a listener, someone who listens to understand not to respond. So not needing, feeling like you have to have a response to something, but just being a sponge and truly absorbing and um, soaking up what you can in order to learn how to be a better ally and a support to the people that you are there for. Amen to that one, sister. <laughs> um, we have a question from Tina. Hey, Tina. She would love to know what our experiences have been and what they are like at school right now, since we are at school online, I think for most of us. She would like to know how are our teachers, educators, professors facilitating conversations or shifting the curriculum to be um, to create anti racist environments? Uh, I can open up the floor for this one. I think not so much of how to make it anti racist, like conversations, but how to hold just tough conversations like this in general. Um, my class had a conversation of the storming at the Capitol and it was a lot of back and forth, um, an opinion I really didn't agree with, but I think um, our teachers are trying to have us learn how to respect all opinions, but to still be able to disagree with them and to share our perspectives so that we can hopefully educate those because especially since right now we're online so we are the media that we consume so a lot mm. of people just being in their house with their conservative parents are only taking in those experiences so I think it's a lot about um what my what the panelists have said before of like what Shar said being a sponge and absorbing the other experiences that the your classmates are telling you that they've had I mean, yeah, I totally get it because I was a Karen or I was with you in that class. So it was it, it was very difficult to situate that sort of conversation because we began with the storming of the Capitol and then the individuals and then sort of how that led up. So that sort of conversation shifted from the Capitol to how America should be dealing with very radical extremists and white supremacists. So there was there was a whole shift of conversation. But it's weird because not a lot of teachers are sort of addressing it. It seems like if being anti-racist is siding with like some sort of like political ideal where we've sort of tried to have these different kinds of conversations and it just becomes more and more difficult to really say anything. Um, I know that a lot of times teachers do appreciate when you're listening in, um, a lot of teachers do appreciate when you let someone else take the floor, but um, it's just, it's a little bit confusing because we would like to have these kinds of conversations, but it's still sort of like a very touchy subject for some individuals. Right. Um, I'm 
sorry, just reading a question that is uh, coming in. There is an inappropriate comment uh, that is not appreciated. Um, but from Peachy Fresh Thinking, curious, what are some small ways you have experienced racism, implicit or explicit, when interacting with a business? Two, if you open your own business today, what ways might you express your values around inclusion through your brand? Um, I'd like to start with this one. I think, number one, I don't know about you guys, but one thing I've experienced and my family has experienced are individuals who think we cannot afford things. Um, and my mom is a registered nurse and she's had to prove that countless of times. And I think, you know, for me, if I were to own a business, I'm putting pride flags, Black Lives Matter. I'm letting you know that you are welcome in my establishment and you will be, you know, treated as a human being that you rightfully deserve. And also I think, you know, it'll drive those who don't agree with those out of my store. Um, and I just think just being able to show that I stand with you, this establishment stands with you. If people are spending their money on something, you deserve to shop and feel welcome and have your services, whatever it may be, and know that you'll be treated as a human being. I think that's something some businesses kind of lack and kind of, you know, fail to do and just creating and hiring people who look like the people that they are serving. I think that's super important. You should be able to walk in any establishment and see plus size individuals, people of different skin tones, different sexualities, people who, you know, might be in wheelchairs, just being inclusive, like everyone is welcome here. I think that's the message that I would want to portray. I mean, I know that it's sometimes difficult when people have a small business and they're trying their best to be as inclusive as possible, even though it's possible with any business, but you know, it's, it's important that as much as the people who are running the business, it's important for the people who are consuming the business to be aware of what's happening sort of behind the screen. I love it when like someone, I know that I have a few friends of mine who bought like a bunch of like Black Lives Matter sweaters and stuff like that. And they didn't just say like, oh my God, like look at this sort of like how cute it is. Like they sat down with me and they're like, you know what? This is a really great organization helping women of color find jobs. Like this sweater and these proceeds and then they sort of gave me that whole narrative. So I think not only like being the person who's in charge of uh, everything that's put out there, it's being the consumer and being aware of what you're buying and where that's sort of going to. And I would like to uh, add on to what Gabriel's saying about the whole ethically consuming, how you you can vote with your money, how we were saying um, most of us aren't 18, you know, I'm 18 now because my birthday was yesterday, but so I can vote, but um, voting with your money is a really big thing so just looking at businesses that are supporting the cause that you are passionate about and seeing how your money can fund something that you support i most definitely agree um but just for like the second half of that question in regards to having your own business. I don't have my own business, obviously. I'm a college student right now, but uh, but um, I am currently an RA or a resident assistant here at my, at my university. And one thing that I can say that I feel could also in a way be implemented in a business. Um, I threw it out there to all of my residents who, because I know I don't just have white residents or black residents. I have people who hold various identities. And I threw it out there that if there's any type of program that they want to see or not program, but just if they have a holiday or something that, or a part of their culture that they want to be recognized in some way, if they wanted a special door deck or some type of wall decoration that they wanted to have be included to make their home away from home feel like a real home, um, to inform me on that and I'd be more than happy to do something but then I also ask them to help alongside me to one make them feel apart and make them feel included but also to make sure that 
I'm not appropriating their culture and that I'm appreciating their culture because I don't know everything about everything. And I most definitely don't know about things that don't have anything to do with my culture, but I would love to learn more. And it allowed for them one to understand that, wow, this is somebody who actually cares about my well-being and cares and makes wants me to feel a part of the community and wants me to feel a part of this community. And I think the same thing can be said about somebody who runs a business because when you're a business, especially a small business, you're within that community and you have to know the people in your community in order to one, have folks still keep coming in so that way you can have a profit. But also that's how you gain customer loyalty. That's also how your customers want to come to you. People want to come to you because you're about making them feel like they're a part of something. So I think that that's, that's just very important. I love it. I love all the answers. Um, you know, the last question before we get into a Q&A is, what advice do you have for President Joe Biden and Madam Vice President Kamala Harris when it comes to, you know, how they take on racial equity as an immediate priority in their administration? What advice would you have for them? I'll take this one on first because um, Saba's laughing because my ultimate goal is to become president of the United States. So it's only right that I take this first. Yes, um, <laughs> um, but the advice that I would give them is to be true to what they said in the beginning, um, to not, to not fold, to not wage or, or waver in any way in order to appease those that, to, to appease those in like in Congress or to pe to appease other people because we know lobbying takes place in all in all aspects of of politics and I think that it's important that they don't that they don't waver at all. Um, you you made a promise. You know what needs to be done. You know that there is a great divide in this nation. You know that is people who are hurting and reparations need to be made. Things need to be amended and they have to be true to that completely. Um, and. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We've literally gone through so much within these four years and prior to the four years before pre-Donald Trump to where politicians have, have wavered too much and it's time that they stop and they need to be held more accountable and they need to stand up and stand up to that accountability and be responsible for it. Yeah. Char, you've got some people in the comments endorsing your presidency already. <laughs> so love to see it. Thank um, you. I appreciate it. <laughs> if anyone has any questions that you would like uh, for us to answer, or um, please don't hesitate to put it in the little chat box down there. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for everyone who has been here and who has been respectful and has kept it a safe um a safe space. I think everyone here has just, you know, incredible, incredible views and we're all going to do great things. And I would greatly appreciate it if you all could go around and just say the one thing that you hope people take away from this panel tonight. I can start and I'll say that I hope people can take away from this is how possible it is to be anti-racist, that there is hope. This isn't an impossible goal. Um, it is very doable. So that's just something that I hope people are taking away from this. I think another key factor that I really want people to take away is that, you know, you should learn how to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. You know, mm -hmm. these conversations are very difficult and they're not going to be easy. I mean, knowing us and there's a little bit snippet of the experiences that we all see kind of ties us together, whether we've lived them or not, um, we, we understand what's happening around the world. And we need to come to the notion with a lot of things wrong with our nation and a lot of things wrong with everything around us. But, you know, you learn that these conversations need to happen, even if they make you or the other individual uncomfortable. Because if we don't start pushing out that narrative of anti-racism, it won't happen. It's to begin with our conversations and lead our way up to social policy. And I think 
starting with just talking is enough. So get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Karen and Gabriel. Um, I also hope that um, all of the um, the guests here um, have more faith in Gen Z and also, you know, join us in the fight for making the world a better place. Um, because, you know, I think a lot of people underestimate us just because we're young, but, you know, obviously you've seen here, we are all, you know, very educated and passionate um, people. And I hope that you all um, join us in the fight for making the world, making the world a better place. Um, I think what I hope that people take away from this is that there's still hope, actually, like, I hope that you guys know that there's still hope, um, because I think things, especially these last four years, have just looked so bleak, and almost like there, I mean, people right now have a right to be burnt out. And I think that in a way that some people do feel burnt out and it's having people lose hope that maybe others have felt burnt out too. But I think this conversation is a testament that there are some people who are still ready to be on fire and seeing that there are people who are very lively in the chat that also are ready to be on fire. And I think one thing about fire is it grows as long as it's like, it's touching another thing. So as long as we're just like matches connected one next to the other, like you can, you can still, your fire can be reignited even if right now you're burnt out. And I just really hope that that's something that everyone is seeing today that there is still a possibility or still a chance to produce something better, to be something better than what we were before. Yeah, I would just like to agree with what everyone has said so far. And um, just to add on, I think a big thing that everyone can take away from this is that, um, or I hope everyone takes away from this, is that you have a community here to support you. And, um, you know, we're here for you to have these conversations. And like Gabriel said earlier, it's important to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Amen. You know, I think for me, I would say, take care of yourselves during this because it's a fight that is not over and it won't be over anytime soon. But don't all take breaks at the same time because the train will stop moving. You know what I mean? So make sure you gotta take your break when you know that somebody else is still on the front line. I think it's just super important that don't give up. Like just don't give up, keep up the good fight, keep having these conversations even when they do get difficult. And people, the people you love will disappoint you. I think that's one thing to acknowledge. And that's okay. You know, we all have our downfalls and we all have, you know, we all have our flaws, but I think just being able to accept those flaws and figure out a way to move on and still keep that love, keep that peace, keep that unity is going to take us farther than creating a bigger divide. So just don't give up keep having those difficult conversations. And like Gabriel said, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Growth is present in those spots. I just wanna thank Leah, Karen, Char, Gabriel and Bella for being a part of this conversation. Thank you so much. Your insight was just like remarkable and incredible. Thank you for the energy that you guys have brought. Um, thank you to everyone who attended this panel virtually um, appreciate it so much. Thank you. And this has been a remarkable experience for me. I've learned so much from my peers. And if there's one thing that I know for sure is that Gen Z is going places. Gen Z is doing big things. We're full of big hearts and we've got big brains with big ideas. And we're definitely going to bring about some change. And thank you to Carrie, who's going to say a few words quickly for just creating the first inclusion project so that this conversation could be possible. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Carrie. You guys are amazing. Um, I just, I know that we're all virtual, but I still think they can feel it. Like, like, like seriously, this, everybody give Gen Z a big hand. Cause Seba, Leah, Gabriel, Shar, Karen, Bella, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for 
just sharing your ideas and your thoughts. And um, I am always heartened when I hear young people and their ideas and their experiences and what they can bring to the future. So thank you for being a part of the Inclusion First project. And Kaseba, again, thank you for moderating and for going in the chat and the Q&A and like getting all the panelists, like that was incredible. So um, lots and lots of love to you for doing that as well. And I just wanna acknowledge that, you know, we're all here, we're all here to learn and to grow and to understand what anti-racism looks like in our lives and to not look away from the ugly underbelly of racism. It's uncomfortable, it sucks, it hurts, it's jarring, but it is there. And I think that it came on this call on this Zoom today because this is important work and we are reaching more people. And the more people we reach, the more, you know, opportunities that we have to come into contact with different and opposing mindsets. And that's totally okay because that is part of this process. That obviously not okay what was said, um, but this is important that we're doing this and that when we come up against resistance, we just keep going and we really see why it matters so much. So thank you all for being super brave, for being here um, and for sharing your love and your light with us um, around anti-racism and for uh, making the world a better place like one moment at a time. So to our audience, thank you so much for being here. We just kicked off an incredible Inclusion First project, Anti-Reason for Allies. We will be back next month um, talking at the intersection of Black history, American history, and anti-racism, what you need to know to be a good anti-racist. And I'm also kicking off a new series called Conversations with Carrie. It's going to be small groups where we just get together on a regular Zoom meeting um, where we can all see each other and have a discussion about what you're dealing with in your life and how you're walking in anti-racism. So we hope to see you join our mailing list and um, you will be hearing more from us, all of us, for sure. Um, if you, uh, panelists, if you did not put your IG um, handle in the chat, will you do that? And I will make sure that I send that out to everyone who's on this call as well. So you can follow these amazing <coughs> and leaders going forward. Thank you so much everyone for being here and we will see you next time.